John Dewey, of course, had a very deep connection to the University of Chicago. He was chair of the university's philosophy department from 1894 to 1904. And while here, Dewey's intellectual work helped launch the Chicago School of Pragmatism, one of the most prominent and influential intellectual movements of the late 19th and early 20th century. And importantly, in 1896, he created the University of Chicago Laboratory School. Uh, in 1981, the Dewey Lectureship in Jurisprudence was established with the John Dewey Foundation, and it happened because then Dean Gerhard Casper decided that the law school should recognize Dewey's ties to the university and his contributions to legal theory. And uh, Dean Casper then corresponded with Sidney Hook, who was then the president of the John Dewey Foundation, about establishing a lectureship in Dewey's name at the law school. And Hook readily agreed and generously funded the John Dewey Lectureship in Jurisprudence. And at that time, Sidney Hook wrote the following to Dean Casper. John Dewey's association with the University of Chicago was so central to his philosophical career and so fruitful for so many disciplines. It is a source of particular gratification to the directors of the foundation to establish this lectureship in his name. And it's our particular gratification today for the law school to continue that tradition with Professor Green's lecture. Since its founding, the lecture quickly established itself uh, as with an illustrious history, uh, just a few notes in that illustrious history. John Rawls' his famous paper, The Idea of Public Reason, visited itself a Dewey Lecture, and then several years subsequently, it was published in our law review. And we've had many esteemed philosophers deliver the Dewey Lecture, Amartya Sen, Robert Dworkin, uh, Jurgen Habermas, Hillary Putnam, Sir Bernard Williams, Catherine McKinnon, Peter Singer, and of course our own Martha Nussbaum. And so I'm delighted today that we add further distinction to the history of the lecture by having Professor Les Green deliver the 2016 Dewey Lecture. Uh, now to introduce him, I will introduce uh, Professor Brian Leiter. Uh, as you all know, Brian is the Carl N. Llewellyn Professor of Jurisprudence and the director of the Center for Law, Philosophy, and Human Values. And all of us at the law school know Brian's teaching and research interests lie in the area of moral, political, and legal philosophy. Uh, both in the Anglophone and the Continental traditions, as well as being an expert in the law of evidence. Uh, Professor Leiter is the author of numerous articles that have appeared in both philosophy journals and in law reviews. He is the author of numerous books, including the two most recent, Why Tolerate Religion and Nietzsche on Morality. So please join me in welcoming Professor Leiter to welcome Professor Green. Thanks to Dean Miles for that very nice introduction. And it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce to you today this year's Dewey Lecturer, Leslie Green, who in my judgment, and not only mine, is the most interesting, insightful, and talented legal philosopher at work in the English-speaking world today. I know I have consistently learned more from Professor Green than from anyone else in the field. Since 2007, Green has been the professor of the philosophy of law at Oxford University, as well as the Pauline and Max Gordon Fellow at Balliol College, Oxford. <clears throat> now, the Gordon Fellowship, as it happens, was endowed by a 1969 graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, and also a graduate of Balliol, Philip Gordon, uh, who happily has been able to join us today. So welcome, Mr. Gordon. We're delighted you could be here for this occasion. Professor Green is also a professor of law and distinguished university fellow at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, where he teaches each September. He has been a visiting professor at many law schools, including New York University, the University of California at Berkeley, the University of Texas at Austin, and in 2009 here at Chicago. Prior to taking up the chair at Oxford, which is one of just two university-wide chairs in legal philosophy there, Professor Green taught for 20 years at Osgoode Hall Law School at York University in Toronto. He has also given other distinguished name lectures in law and philosophy prior to the Dewey Lecture, including the Kadish Lectures at Berkeley, the Leon Green Lecture at the University of Texas, and the Julius Stone Lecture at the University of Sydney, among others. Professor Green has written widely and always with style and analytical penetration about a remarkably wide array of issues in political and legal philosophy over the last 30 years. 
A selection of titles of published work will give you some idea of his range. And I mentioned just a few. The authority of the state. Should law improve morality? Sex-neutral marriage. On being tolerant. Two views of collective rights. Civil disobedience and academic freedom. Rights of exit. Pornographizing, subordinating, and silencing. Are language rights fundamental? and associative obligations in the state, among many other topics. It's but one further indication of his stature that when Oxford University Press decided to issue a third edition several years ago of the seminal work of 20th century jurisprudence, H.L.A. Hart's The Concept of Law from 1961, Professor Green was chosen to introduce the work to a new generation of readers and to supply a detailed guide to further reading on the many issues raised by that work. I and the other participants in the Law and Philosophy Workshop here in Chicago had the good fortune to discuss the introduction with him just this past Monday. Well, as we come off an electoral cycle notable for what we might say was a good deal of problematic speech <laughs> of the kind the Buddha likely would not have cared for, Professor Green's topic today is particularly timely. He will talk to us not about what speech ought to be lawful, but what speech we ought to engage in. Please join me in welcoming Leslie Green to speak to us today about right speech. Uh, Dean Miles Bryant, th thank you so much for that. Um, I woke up this morning, I knew I had a hard act to follow. Uh, and uh, you may think that this lecture was pressing. I assure you that that was not the case. It, the topic was agreed, and actually the date agreed uh, a long time ago. Uh, so as Brian says, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, something unusual, I think, in, in legal philosophy, the relevance of certain medieval Indian ideas to contemporary thought about speech and morality. And uh, I'm not a Buddhist or a Buddhologist or a Sanskrit or Pali scholar. Um, but I did find a lot of illumination in these texts. And if you'll indulge me in one thing, I'm going to refer throughout the lecture, in case there are any Sanskrit scholars here, to what the Buddha wrote or what the Buddha said, rather than the way we might talk about what Socrates thought or what Homer thought, um, just using that as a label uh, for the author's line, a complex tradition argument. There's quite a lot of bad speech I think should be tolerated. The free speech principle tells us that. And in a way, that's its point. We rarely need a right to say what will be considered true or just or pleasing. A right's needed when what we have to say is false or bad or repugnant. That is, the moral right to free speech gives us the right to say things that are, from the moral point of view, wrong. It does so in service of the great goods that respect for that principle serves. Reliable knowledge, good government, and personal autonomy. Now, free speech does not, of course, protect us in doing any and every sort of wrong. It has its limits. Free speech does not protect fraud, or incitement, or defamation, or hatred. But sometimes, even within its uncontested core, the principle has more limited force than is sometimes understood. Importantly, having a right to say something does not give anyone a reason to say it. The fact, for example, that we have, as I think we do, a moral right to offend others, to mock their faith, to confront them with obscene imagery, is no justification for doing any of those things. The right to speak freely governs the responses of the potential audiences of speech. What it is right for people to say involves the norms that should govern speakers themselves. When asked, why did you say something so appalling, we cannot intelligibly answer, because I had a right to do so. But then what are the norms that should govern speakers in speaking? Well, there are special purpose norms that apply to particular contexts, for example, in class, or in court, or in the church. And there are special norms that apply to particular subjects. Philosophers should strive to write with clarity and precision. 
poets with music and metaphor. But what I have in mind are general purpose moral norms that govern communicative speech in a range of contexts and without regard to subject. Are there any such norms? Well, surprisingly, the Western legal and philosophic tradition gives us very little guidance here. The morality of speech, with few exceptions, is more concerned with what should be tolerated than with what should be said. And, and I should note, as someone who's contributed, as, as Brian generously notes, uh, probably too much to the question of what speech should be tolerated, I'm trying to redress the balance a bit today uh, for those who keep saying, Green, why do you keep going on about this stuff? Um, I'm going to say something about the other problem. Now, admittedly, any general moral view will have upshots for speech. So, for example, speech is just one sort of action, and the moral norms that guide action will govern speech. So utilitarians and deontologists will say about speech what they say about anything. Maximize aggregate welfare, or do your duty and respect people's rights. I, however, am interested in norms that are, if not speech-specific, at least more speech-sensitive than those norms. Norms that there's a reason to pick out and use when we're thinking about how to talk and to teach to children and others as norms. Not all rights are so sensitive to presuppositions about their use. Compare, for example, the right to privacy. As far as privacy is concerned, it's all the same whether we choose to keep all personal information to ourselves or to post every joy and pain to Facebook. The right to privacy is satisfied provided we have control over what others see and hear. The right to vote, however, is different. If all we have is control over whether or not we vote, we do not have the right to vote. The point of this right is to enable voting. And thus, to respect the right to vote, we also need to organize elections, regulate them, and so forth. A government that did none of that but said, go ahead and vote, no one's stopping you, would be missing the point. The right to vote makes sense only on the presupposition that there are elections. And that explains why the liberty to vote is more important than the liberty not to vote. Why, for example, Australians enjoy the right to vote even though voting is, in Australia, compulsory. And because the right to vote so presupposes voting, we have fairly well-developed ideas about what norms should govern voting. We should keep informed about the issues. We should turn up. We should vote. We should buy or sell votes, and so on. You might call those the principles of right voting. I think free speech is much more like voting than it is like privacy. And J.S. Mill, um, oh, I've already taken him down. Uh, J.S. Mill thought that, too. <clears throat> in On Liberty, he writes, we have an absolute freedom of opinion and sentiment on all subjects, practical or speculative, scientific, moral, or theological. You probably all remember that. But he goes on to say that this freedom matters because speaking and listening is so important. Mill continues, judgment is given to men that they may use it. And it's the duty of governments, the duty, of governments and of men to form the truest opinions that they can. Mill even says famously, when debate lags and orthodoxy sets in, society should even provide a devil's advocate to stand up for unpopular views. This is obviously not the view of one who thinks the right to speak is just a matter of being permitted to say what we like without external interference. But then, the question arises, how should we proceed in discharging our duty to form true opinions, our duty to speak up or to speak out? What, that's to say, are the norms of right speech? Well, the resources of the sort I'm looking for can't really be found in Mill, but they can be found in elsewhere. And one place I've been looking and found some illumination is in classical Indian Buddhist philosophy. In the schools of Indian Buddhism, at least they're preserved in the Pali Canon. In the Sanyutta Nikaya, four speech norms are given crisp formulation and exposition as the duty, uh, as the doctrine of right speech. 
abstaining from lying, from divisive speech, from abusive speech, and from idle chatter, writes the Buddha, this is right speech. So I want to try to locate these four principles in the morality of speech, give them a partial explanation and defense, and then end with a few very brief thoughts about their relevance to law and to politics. I'll warn you right away that this is not going to be a demonstrative argument. I'm not going to prove these principles. I'm not going to derive them from propositions about the general good or freedom or reason or anything of that sort. Indeed, I think almost no interest in principles of morality admit of such a defense. But I'm going to make, try to make them seem attractive to you by explaining the value in conforming to each of the four and then trying to refute certain prominent objections to each of them. First, though, a threshold issue. Why well, think that speaking, as opposed to responding to speech, raises any moral issues? and how to raise that for ourselves. The Buddha offers the following comment on this point, uh, I have it on the slide, in a sutta in the Jima Nikaya, when he's speaking to his son Rahula. Buddha says, whenever you want to perform a verbal act, you should reflect on it. If, on reflection, you know it would lead to self-affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to both, it would be an unskillful verbal <coughs> act with painful consequences, painful results. Then any verbal act of that sort is absolutely unfit for you. Well, set aside the utilitarian flavor of painful consequences and the deontological flavor of absolutely unfit that we find in this translation. Neither of them is faithful to Buddhist moral thought. This is an admonition to the wise. And it's not that complicated. As they used to say, engage brain before opening mouth. <laughs> a central idea of Buddhist moral psychology is that too much of our daily conduct is mindless. And a central ideal of Buddhist morality is that there is value to be found in cultivating present moment awareness. I cannot defend either of these propositions today, but I think each of them is correct. To a civilization like ours that's driven to act and to achieve, a morality that emphasizes engagement and attachment, the idea of val that values to be found also in the being mode of life and in detachment from our desires may seem strange. Nietzsche mocked it as the withdrawal from life into the oriental nothingness called nirvana. About nothingness, I'm going to say, well, nothing. <laughs> but in the place of nirvana, you could think, for example, of Aristotle's eudaimonia, or a similarly general conception of human flourishing. Nothing I have to say about the few principles turns on how we fill in the details of human happiness. Or so I shall assume. The first principle is a familiar one. Avoid false speech. <laughs> Here, the Buddha describes a person who breaks this norm. When he's been called to a town meeting, a group meeting, a gathering of his relatives, or the guild, or the royal court, if he's asked as a witness, come and tell a good man, what do you know? If he doesn't know, he says, I know. If he does know, he says, I don't know. If he hasn't seen, he says, oh, I've seen. And if he has seen, he says, no, I haven't seen that. Thus, he consciously tells lies for his own sake, for the sake of another, or for the sake of a certain reward. People lie, I think, if when speaking competently and sincerely, they say that P, they believe P to be false, and they take themselves to be speaking in what I'm going to call a warranting context. <coughs> By which I mean they're not speaking ironically or hyperbol hyperbolically or metaphorically, but in a context in which people can reasonably take their words as a reason for belief. That's what I mean by a warranting context. As the Buddha writes, in a town meeting, a group meeting, a gathering of his relatives, his guild, or the court, or if he's asked as a witness. These are circumstances where we can reasonably suppose people will take what we say as true. 
Now, there are two features of the Buddhist thought there. First, that false speech, to the extent that it is to be disapproved, is intention dependent. You notice the lawyer lies, <coughs> consciously tells lies for his own sake and so forth. And that it's truth oriented. Lying is in the province of speech that aims at getting things in some way or other right. Well, maybe this is because here we're dealing with bearing false witness, and there one is called on to tell the truth in, in the example. However, if the wrong is in the misleading, one can certainly do that without stating any falsehood at all. And if what's wrong about misleading people is that it manipulates others solely as a means to one's own ends, or treats them without the respect that we owe them as people capable of conceiving their ends, then it can also be wrong to mislead by recklessness or by negligence, at least when one knows or should know that others will depend on one's word. So I will assume that this first principle requires us to avoid not only outright lies as I just defined them in the narrower sense, but also other kinds of manipulative falsehoods. Of the four speech norms I'm going to defend, this, I think, is the only one whose validity is never doubted. It's found in every moral tradition with which I'm familiar. Don't lie. But how stringent is it? For Immanuel Kant, some of whose ideas I echoed in the last paragraph, uh, the wrong of lying is absolute. Kant thinks we should never lie under any circumstances for any purposes, not even to prevent a murderer <coughs> from finding his intended victim. Few have found his argument convincing, and even loyal Kantians twist and turn to show that it either doesn't follow from Kant's own premises, or if it does, it doesn't apply in the way Kant says it does. But I'm troubled, on the other hand, not by Kant's rigorism, after all, what is view, as I read to you, is pretty rigoristic itself. I'm troubled by his formalism. A speech norm that is truly absolute in force will have to be formulated under a very tight description. <clears throat> One, for example, that excludes from the definition of lying or misleading all sorts of falsehood that are not absolutely prohibited. Indeed, that's what Kant himself does. So we may have to say, this is Kant's strategy, that something isn't a lie if its recipient had no right to know the truth. So that's how you, you can dissemble to the murderer at your door. Or we may have to say it isn't the lie if we make a mental reservation as to its truth. Now, as I see it, this is morality as a tax lawyer might think of it. There's nothing wrong with doing whatever the rules do not expressly and clearly prohibit. <clears throat> I find more plausible Bernard Williams' view that the wrong in lying consists in undermining trust not in breach of a rule. We are social animals with a basic need to cooperate, and we cannot do that without a general respect for accuracy, for knowing the true and the false, and for sincerity, telling the truth as we see it when we do. And for that to work, we need to value these intrinsically. Our common need to be able to take as true most of what others tell us is, in ordinary circumstances, a familiar idea in the philosophy of language. These arguments, I think, show that veracity is important to human flourishing. But they do not show how important it is. The main objection to the prohibition on lying has always been that sometimes it's actually not wrong to lie. I conceded that. The objection then continues that the correct principle is whatever it tells us when it is and when it is not permissible to lie. For example, general utility. But this objection is telling only if the norm should be understood in the formalistic, indefeasible way that I've already rejected. The odd lie does not undermine the basis of trust among people. We communicate intelligibly even when we know that the cooperative norms of speech are routinely broken, and the principle of charity exerts a holistic overall influence on us, not a particular influence on each utterance one by one. We are never going to get an absolute, or I think even near absolute, duty to avoid any falsehood on any of these grounds. And that being so, I think we shouldn't worry that the norm 
avoid false speech admits of exception. The fact of the matter is that our loyalty to the truth, though extremely important, is not indefeasibly important. And despite having the occasional absolutist text, on the whole, the Buddhist moral tradition shares that view. But that's not quite the end of things. The absolute character of a ban on lying does, after all, explain the importance of the norm. It's an indefeasible absolute norm. So if we remove that, how are we going to explain or measure the importance of telling the truth in speech? Well, here's the Buddhist's account, or the Buddha's account. One tries to abandon wrong speech and enter into right speech. This is one's right effort. One is mindful to abandon wrong speech and enter and remain in right speech. This is one's right mindfulness. These three qualities, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness, run and circle around right speech. Now this sort of puts the point in slightly uh, opaque technical terms, but I think the idea is simple enough. Many other sound moral norms are related in important ways to the norm of right speech, the norms of right speech, which are at their center. Here, uh, for example, is a similar formulation we find in the Dhammapada, the, se the second of the quotations here. The person who tells a lie, who transgresses in this one thing, transcending concern for the world beyond, there is no evil he might not do. So the idea is not that each and every lie is absolutely wrong, but a disposition to mislead, for example, by lying, enables a great many other evils. Its constitutive, or at least a standard concomitant, of fraud, conversion, infidelity, and many other things. <clears throat> and since one might be called to account for one's wrongdoing, a readiness to lie will turn out to be quite handy also in the long game. You lie to your partner, and then to your lawyer, and then to the judge and jury, and finally, to deal with the guilt, you lie to yourself. When the disposition to avoid false speech is substantially eroded, either in a person or in a community, either falsehoods are not avoided at all, or people simply cease to care whether things are true or false. It becomes a community that is post-truth. And at some point, people will realize that it is all spin all the time, that there is no correction factor that one can even apply as we do when people plead in their own cause. And when that happens, many important forms of human cooperation and communication break down. The second norm the Buddha offers to us is the following. Avoid abusive speech. <coughs> Whatever the content of our speech, our delivery should be via words that are, I'm quoting now, soothing to the ear, that are affectionate, that go to the heart, that are polite, appealing, pleasing to people at large. Now this last idea should not be thought of as saying we should never offend anyone. The person-directed effects of speech depend on social custom and convention. For example, whether it's affirming or neutral or insulting to call gay people queer depends on how that will be taken by people at large. That is, by ordinary competent speakers. So again, quoting now from the Anguttara Nikaya, we should avoid words that are harsh, cutting, bitter to others, abusive of others, provoking anger, and destroying concentration. <coughs> As with lying, we must not read this in a deontological way. Remember, this is speech that is to be avoided, not speech that's to be banned. Sometimes we can't avoid it, for pleasing words may fail to communicate our intent. As Mill says, we cannot hold our ideals without being willing to test them, and that means willing to test them against competitors. And the only competitors worth testing them against are those that are held seriously, maybe even fervently. Still, thinking of the medium rather than the message, abuse of speech is to be avoided where we can. Compare the Buddha's reason for avoid avoiding abuse of speech with an idea current among some Anglophone philosophers. Several writers suggest that hateful speech, for example, is to be avoided, even prohibited, on the ground that it causes or constitutes a status injury. 
Ray Langton argues that it can constitute subordination. Jeremy Waldron, that it can undermine our assurance that we are equal in status and dignity. The Buddha, however, draws our attention instead to the tendency of abusive speech to provoke anger and destroy concentration in its target. Those are instrumentally adverse to sustaining insight into what gives life value, and they even constitute an aspect of disvalue. That's to say, the Buddha's argument rests in a conjecture not about the sociology of language, Alla Langton and Waldron, but about moral psychology. Abusive speech provokes unhealthy reactions in its target. And Thomas Hobbes makes a similar observation. In Leviathan, he stresses the tendency of abusive speech to escalate. People want to be respected. They want their standing as being worthy of respect to be known. They respond to signs of disrespect with anger, escalating disrespect, and Hobbes says, ultimately, war. So Hobbes urges us to avoid contumely and let no man, by deed, word, countenance, or gesture, declare hatred and contempt of another. Doubts about this norm are of two kinds. The first rests on the subjective nature of abuse, and the second on the idea that the abused themselves have adequate resources to respond. They should just ignore it. Waldron offers the first criticism and tries to address it in the case of hate speech by suggesting that worrisome subjectivity inheres in offense, but not in hatred. It's a subjective question whether a person is offended by my speech. It's an objective question, he says, whether one, that, uh, one's assurance is undermined. The former is a hurt, the latter a harm. But this argument doesn't work. The subjective-objective distinction does not track the difference between offense and harm. It cuts across it. Just as some people are too easily offended, some people are too hard to reassure. And some societies are such that assurance is hard to provide. If we reply that people are entitled only to reasonable assurance as to their standing, we can certainly do the same thing with respect to offense. As the Sutta puts it, we should be alert to whether our words would be considered abusive among people at large. The second objection is internal to Buddhist morality. Along with the Stoics and Jesus, the Buddha thinks that even when subject to abuse, we should generally turn the other cheek. The Dhammapada has it, as an elephant in battle bears the arrows shot from a bow, I will endure insult, for many people have poor self-control. This does not, however, contradict or undermine the norm that abuse of speech is to be avoided. It complements it with a norm about how even abuse of speech should be received, namely, with endurance. Or, if you like putting the two together, we get this. Avoid speaking abusively, and if you find yourself the target of someone's abuse, try to endure it rather than, well, rather than what? Well, we can go at least, I think, as far as Hobbes rather than trying to get even, rather than escalating the warfare of words. Why? Well, first there's Epictetus' point. What harms people is not things in themselves, but their judgments about those things. This is only one of many, many parallels, by the way, between the Stoic and Buddhist thought. Um, and, and there may actually be interesting historical grounds. Alison Gopnik and others have speculated uh, about continuities uh, between them. And in addition to the Stoic point, there's the Buddhist point. Many people have poor self-control. Getting angry with the trolls on your Twitter feed is as sensible as trying to get even with two-year-olds. Getting cross at them will make you unhappy, and trying to get even will keep you very, very busy. This does not alter the fact that the abusers themselves have a vice of character, a moral failing that damages their own well-being. Nor does it deny that it can be unfair to expect people to endure abuse, especially if they're members of a group who are regular targets of it. But once we start wondering about what's fair and unfair in the realm of speech, we're back to the realm of what rights people have, rather than the question of what it's right for them to do. Right speech doesn't deny the importance of fairness in speech, but neither does it attempt to illuminate it. We already know enough about 
that. So the key move here um, is that on feeling is that feeling abused can replicate the same kind of tension between the objective and the subject and is feeling offended um, or, for example, feeling uh, uh, put upon. And it's interesting to note, I won't go into this part of the argument today, that the same thing, by the way, is true about misleading. People often think this is a peculiar feature of offense, that it admits of a subjective reading. But you can also feel lied to and not actually be lied to. So the subject of objective problem is just quite a generic one. It's not a particular feature of offense and abuse. The third norm the Buddha proposes is the following. <coughs> Avoid divisive speech. We should not speak so as to break communities apart, to set up an us-them barrier that precludes understanding and thus precludes both agreement and disagreement. Divisive speech can overlap, of course, with false and abusive speech. And that's a good way to be divisive, it is to tell lies about groups and then abuse them. Divisive speech can overlap, but I think it can also be wrong in its own right. At any rate, the suttas suggest that it can. In the Anguttara and Nikaya, the, the situation is described this way, uh, describing the abusive person. What he's heard here, he tells there, to break those people apart from these people here thus breaking apart those who are united, and stirring up strife between those who have broken apart, he loves factionalism. This principle is less clear in its appeal than are the first two. It presupposes that people should, for some reason or other, stay together. And it's tempting to suppose that this is really a special norm, and that the text is addressed to a monastic community, the Sangha, or perhaps to the whole community of practitioners. There is historical ground for that reading. As soon as the Buddha died, competing schools of Buddhist philosophy emerged, each claiming authenticity for its own interpretation of the doctrines. And then division within Indian Buddhism, Buddhism made it vulnerable to the dominant Brahminical culture. So it's easy to see why early Buddhist writers would have thought divisive speech would be, uh, should be deplored. On the other hand, when the Buddha does exclusively have monks and nuns in mind, he usually addresses them that way. For example, he says that people should only speak about the important things in life. Sorry, when he says that people should only speak about the important things in life, he makes it clear that this is not directed at lay people. Now from the, uh, again from the suttas, why should you not do this? Speak about things other than philosophy and the important things in life. Such talk, monks, is not related to the goal. It's not fundamental to the holy life. It does not conduce to disenchantment. Notice that it's addressed only to the monks. There's no suggestion here that everyone ought only to talk about the four and noble truths. Is there then a case for avoiding divisive speech, a thin basis for unity, independent of monastic or religious context, and independent of its tendency to cause other wrongs, such as hatred or discrimination? I think there is. Before we can agree, there's much on, before we can disagree, there's much on which we have to agree. For one thing, before we can communicate at all, we need common norms that partly constitute us as a speech community. And then, if we're to have a conversation on any particular matter, the most elementary requirement, if we're to fulfill Mill's duty to speak and to test ideas, we need cooperative norms that make speech possible. H.P. Grice, the philosopher of language, cataloged a number of these. For example, this norm. Make your conversational contribution, such as is required, at the stage at which it occurs, um, in light of the accepted purposes or direction of the talk you are engaged in. Grice. Accepted purposes or direction here means jointly accepted. How could divisive speech undermine such norms? As David Lewis and others have suggested, norms of communication have a tendency to adjust themselves in a way that preserves the presumption that other people are cooperative members of the community. If in speech we treat other people as not worth speaking to, 
as utterly different, a norm may well emerge to ratify that presumption. They may still be addressed in our speech, we may speak to them or about them, but the informal norms of standing, who needs to be answered, who can be ignored, adapt so that we no longer have one community disputing, but two or more communities speaking in harmony inter se, but wholly inter se. It's a familiar speculation that the social media have facilitated this fragmentation, but that surely wasn't necessary for it. Divisive speech is in this way self-ratifying. Does that matter? It does of Miller's right in thinking the truth or our grasp on it depends on debate and dialogue. Mill made that point in defense of freedom of speech, but you can see how it is also relevant to how we speak. Mill says, truth has no chance, but in proportion as every side of it, every opinion, which embodies any fraction of the truth, not only finds advocates, but is so advocated as to be listened to. It's that last clause I want you to notice. The truth must be so advocated as to be listened to. <clears throat> truth needs its advocates, but its advocates must address each other as members of one community. As one community of inquiry, they must avoid divisive speech. The final principle is perhaps the most challenging of all. In the Nikaias we read, he engages in idle chatter. He speaks out of season. He speaks what isn't factual, what isn't in accordance with the goal. Words that are not worth treasuring. This is the most challenging of the four norms. Something like it, like it appears in all contemplative moral traditions. The rule of Saint Benedict, for example, along with vulgarity, prohibits gossip and praises silence. As Benedict puts it, a monk speaks gently and without laughter, seriously and become it with becoming modesty, briefly and reasonably. The Buddha says he speaks in season. He speaks what's factual in accordance with the goal, with the Dhamma and the Vinaya. He speaks words worth treasuring, seasonable, reasonable, circumscribed, connected always to the goal. And then for greater certainty, the Buddha lists 10 topics of proper conversation among monks, Speak on modesty, contentment, seclusion, non-entanglement, arousing persistence, virtue, concentration, discernment, release, and the knowledge and vision of release. Well, be that as it may, we surely are not all expected to speak like monks, either of Benedict's or the Buddhist kind. After all, we know what David Hume, and even more fervently Emma Goldman, had to say about that kind of thing. Ethologists, moreover, conjecture that gossip and grooming behavior, seem fairly idle, were pivotal in the evolution of human language. And there is no doubt that today, speech that may seem idle is a way of expressing and sustaining social bonds. But even if this is right, it doesn't challenge the norm against idle speech. For idle speech is speech that is, in the circumstances, pointless. And casual or expressive conversation need not be pointless. By casual conversation, I have in mind things like chatting about the weather, discussing victory of the Cubs, commenting on TV, and so on. And by expressive communication, I mean speech, the function of which is not communicative at all, or not primarily communicative. Singing in the shower, assuming you shower alone. Uh, <laughs> asking after someone's health praising their address. In the, to the extent that these constitute and confirm social bonds, they are important to life, and they're outside what I want to call idle speech. No, idle speech is of that sort. Think instead of how, so much, how much utterly pointless speech we encounter every day, from celebrity gossip to the trivia of the, the person on the bus giving an oral ordinance survey map over her cell phone, to the tsunami of trivia that we call Twitter. Those born in the internet era may not realize that this was not always the case, in the way that those born in the era of electricity may not realize that at night it used to be dark. <laughs> but you ask, so what? The easiest answer is this. Life is short. <laughs> 
and idle speech takes up far too much of it. Of course, we have every right to go on wasting our lives in trivia, but as I said at the outset, that gives us no reason to do so. A second reason I think is more important. Idle speech is akin to nuisance. Human speech has the capacity to distract us in a way that bird song does not. In the UK, for example, most trains have a quiet carriage in which cell phone use, amongst other things, is prohibited. It is generally less distracting to sit, to sit in the quiet carriage of a train that has noisy wheels than it is to be trapped in the carriage of a train running silently with people chattering away above a beautifully silent track. Maybe we can even go further. Blue's thought emerged in reaction to the Vedic religion, which was guarded by esoteric speech, ritual chants, and so forth. In reply to this use of speech, the Dhammapada advises, better than a thousand verses composed of meaningless words is a single word, a single word of verse, which having been heard, brings peace. But the criticism that criticism applies not only to ritual speech of the Vedas, but to the, th of the thousand verses, but also to doctrinal controversies that can neither be resolved nor being disputed deep in our understanding. The Buddha admonishes those who develop an addiction to idle polemics. Do not engage in wordy warfare, saying, you don't understand the dumb and discipline. I understand the dumb and discipline. What I say is consistent. What you say isn't. What you thought for so long is entirely reversed. Your statement's refuted. You're talking rubbish. <laughs> this sutta stings, for it's directed at us, at lawyers and philosophers, those verbal nitpickers whose wordy warfare is, from the salvific point of view, useless. The Buddha drives home the point in a parable about the poisoned arrow. A wounded man refuses to have the toxin removed until he is told the clan and caste of the archer, the materials the bow was made of, and a dozen other things that no one knows. Now these are questions to which there is in principle an answer, yet the victim dies waiting for it. The Buddha is even harsher on metaphysical questions, questions to which even if there are in principle answers, no one has any reliable way of approaching them. When there is the view the cosmos is eternal, and when there is the view the cosmos is not eternal, still there is birth, there is aging, there is death, there is sorrow, lamentation, pain, despair, and distress, whose destruction I make known in the here and now. Whereas some Brahmins and contemplatives are addicted to debates such as these, the Buddha continues, you understand this doctrine, I don't understand this doctrine, and so forth, you can see why he wants to abstain from them. This too, he says, is part of virtue. Well, those are the four norms, and let me just conclude with a word about their status, and then two brief words about how they might be supported. The speech norms the Buddha articulates, as I said, are things that are to be avoided. Speech that violates them is, in the Pali Akusala, unskillful, but not wrong in any deontological sense. So violating the speech norm is not, per se, a wrong. Nonetheless, the first and second of the speech norms may involve wrongs. You can wrong people by speaking falsely and abusively. And the third and fourth may involve harms, though not wrongs. You may wonder, having come full circle, how this is related to freedom of speech and the other norms in our political culture. Well, here is one key liberal proposition that I think is correct. We should generally be free to speak in ways that are not right. And here's one key Buddhist proposition that is, I think, also correct. We ought not to use our freedom to speak in ways that are not right. These two propositions are fully consistent with each other. They speak on different planes. Who and what can sustain norms of right speech? Well, many of them are sustained when they are outside the law entirely. In education, 
Dewey made this point very forcefully in relation to schools, in civil society groups, and of course in professional associations, newspapers, even Wikipedia, I notice now, has what you might think of as right speech norms uh, for contributors. But the law can also assist in reaching right speech. Very often in jurisprudence, we think of the law mainly as an enforcer of moral principles, of ideal or perhaps of social morality, the famous disputes between Herbert Hart and Lord Devlin over the propriety of using law in that way turned on that first relation between speech and law. But as even Hayek recognized, government can properly act in many other ways. And in doing so, it's subject to different constraints. For example, the law can be a supporter, not enforcer, but a supporter of uh, principles of morality. The law has vast resources of directive power. It can incentivize, nudge, and reward good conduct. It can act in ways to support institutions that support norms of right speech. Universities, for example, in their self-regulation. Professional associations in their norms, and so on. But finally, law can also, I think, do something else. We certainly cannot change morality by anything on a par with legislation. Social morality has no rules of deliberate change, precisely because it's a matter of custom and convention. But we want our social morality to support ideal morality. And here is another place that the technology of law is handy. Our law, at least on my view, is wholly within deliberate human control. And we can therefore use law not to enforce principles of right speech, but for example, to make those clearer and more effective. And we try to do this, for example, in the law of consent to sexual activity. There is also the indirect effects of legal doctrines. Courts should recognize violations of right speech norms as having aggravating and perhaps other functions within the law. And above all, the law should get out of the way of those who support the norms of right speech, including civil society institutions, an independent bar, and the press. There are many ways in which the law, including the criminal law and private law, can support uh, norms uh, indirectly. And I think right speech is one of, the place, one of the places it should do so. Let me conclude just with uh, the Buddha's words again, now from the Samyutta Nikaya. Speak only the speech that neither torments the self nor does harm to others. That speech is truly well spoken. Speak only endearing speech, speech that's welcome. Speech when it brings no evil to others is pleasant. It's easy to mock those words. They demand of us a kind of benevolence that's often hard to attain. Hard to attain because the will is weak, hard to attain because we are not sure what it requires. But I've tried to suggest that there's nothing incoherent about the ideal, that the four principles, each of them is plausible, that many, uh, or at least the most important objections to them can be answered, that they are consistent with the liberal principle of free speech, and that the law, our law, has a role in sustaining them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Les. Um, we have time now for about 25 minutes, half hour for questions. So, Laura. So we might think that one of the principal values of speech is in accomplishing social and political change. And I worry that this list of right speech is somewhat at odds with that. I think you see it particularly in the context of divisive speech, but also in some of the others, right? So to the extent that you know, we might ask, would divisive speech preclude uh, class conscious or identity based political change, particularly in a context where um, part of the perceived harm is the erasure of difference, either intentional or hegemonic, right? But we could imagine that uh, this would uh, dissuade people from speaking uh, when, in fact, it, it's most valuable for them to do that. Thank you. Um, well, I hope it won't. But just a couple of remarks. So, first of all, I I'm not persuaded that, um, as you put it, that like the most important, or one of the most important roles of speech in human life is, is, is to bring about 
political change. I, I tend to think speech is, avail uh, is available and important for things that are much, <laughs> much more elementary than political change of any kind. But the second point, um, even assuming that that were true, is the following. Note that the Buddha, and this is a very important point, and perhaps I should stress it again, formulates the principles in an advisory way. None of these are prohibitions. There's nothing you're prohibited from doing. You know, Cohen against California is perfectly rightly decided according to the Buddha. Yeah? No one is told you mustn't, you must always speak nicely to your enemies. There are things that we should ordinarily avoid. So try to release your thought from thinking about speech in terms of rights and wrongs, what's permitted and not, and think in terms of what's virtuous and not. Now, there is a very strong tradition of social change. I, I'm, I'm sure you know this. Um, Gandhi is the one that everyone thinks of immediately, but many other people too, uh, in, including, uh, I mentioned Emma Goldman, Rosa Luxemburg, and others, who firmly believe that you can catch more flies with sugar than with vinegar. And um, it's hard to look at yesterday's events and not think that's roughly true. In the back there, please. Hi, thank you. Um, as you're casting about for substantive moral norms pertaining to speech, um, I'm just wondering if there's anything to be gained from looking to the norms implicit in the common law. Um, if we have to go all the way to Buddha to find this. Um, so when you're talking about lying, it's thinking about notions of common law fraud, which prescribes some but not all misrepresentations. Abusive speech, I was thinking about intentional infliction of emotional distress, which um, creates a cause of action not for any wrongful feeling, but only those which are justified. Um, talking about idle, idle chatter and gossip, thinking about torts of invasion of privacy and nuisance, which again set boundaries. There's some, they're not deontological norms, but they are reasonable person norms. The sort that I took you to be describing in Buddha's behalf yeah. in, uh, in the talk. So is there any work, to, anything to be gained from the common law as well? I'm sure, I'm sure there is. The common law is a repository of all, all kinds of ideas, and it would be strange if it were both the case that the, the Buddhist conjectures were compelling and that they didn't find resonance elsewhere in cultures. Um, but, but the reason I, I turn there is if, if we look for a theorized account of speech salient norms, we don't actually find them in these places. I don't really think, I'm not convinced that we find them in the common law. The common law does resonate with some of the principles. Uh, setting aside, as always, of course, lying. Um, much theorized in every moral tradition I know about. People have thought it was wrong to lie. Um, but it would be, I would regard it as confirmatory. The Buddha's view about morality, which is uh, close to my own, I guess, maybe that was one of the reasons I, I found it attractive, um, is a view that treats moral norms as a kind of conjecture about what would promote human flourishing. So the number of, I, I won't go too far down this path, a number of very interesting things follow from this. That although probably the basic sources of value in the Buddha's view of um, have a non-cognitive representation, which should be understood that way, um, moral norms can be true or false, since the conjecture is that, conjecture that following this norm will promote human well-being may be wrong. I, I tend to think of, 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 of the common law as being a set of prescriptions rather than conjectures of that sort. Um, but I'm sure, I'm sure there's, you know, as I say, St. Benedict and, and the Buddha had various thoughts in common. I don't want to suggest it's the only place to look for it. Enlightenment. Genevieve? I think I want to follow up on the broader question. So you said at one point in your talk that whether or not we think these norms are correct doesn't depend on our notion of human flourishing or the good. And I'm not sure I agree with that. So don't okay. for Buddhists or for the Buddha, as understood through these uh, traditions, there is a very particular notion of human flourishing or the good, that these norms are a means to an end. And that's also, I think, one of the reasons why for Buddhists, moral norms can be right or wrong because you test them against the extent to which they get you to the end goal, yes. which is a particular conception of, I think, an egoless person who isn't obsessed with their own mind and their own being. And that's why you can understand, I think, all of these norms as a means of getting you to a particular kind of subjectivity or a particular kind of selfhood. And that's the goal that we're trying to get to. But one might imagine that people have very different conceptions of human flourishing that do not involve the creation of a um, a subjectless person or a person who no longer believes in the, the fiction of the ego, such as social change, class change, um, domination, uh, the routing of the, those in the community who have wrong beliefs through whatever means it takes. That's 
certainly not a Buddhist notion of flourishing, but I think it would lead to a different set of speech norms. I mean, I think it's interesting that you find similarities in a lot of different traditions and suggest that maybe there are similarities in the ends. Uh, but I'm wondering if, you can, if it does make sense to think about these as norms outside of a particular notion of the good or the end, how do we even think about what the norms are appropriate then? Well, um, so here's how I, I like to do um, legal and political philosophy when I can. You, you can't always do this. I, I, I try to think of problems in a kind of modular way. And um, so it's a strength of an argument if it is, it's not going to be neutral among all conceptions of human flourishing. So on that point, you're absolutely correct. And if I suggested that, that would, that would be a serious error if that came across. But reasonably Catholic, there was a range of them. So. Um, I hope I didn't appeal at any point to any distinctive, distinctive Buddha-logical mm -hmm. views about the person. Uh, in fact, I set those aside, um, the doctrine of nothingness and, um, and uh, uh, detachment, um, and invited you to think about other similar things, like, for example, Aristotle. So I, I, th I think that um, there's a range of views of human flourishing for which these, I'm not going to suggest that they're you know, primary good-like analysis, but a, a range. Um, that will be advanced by these. Now, the, the suggestion you made at the end sounded like um, I, I took it. You, I took it. You mean I took you mean the converse of that. The things you mentioned about domination that sound, didn't sound like a conception of human flourishing. Someone someone wants to dominate people. It sounds like a bad thing, right? Maybe, um, maybe they want to maybe they want to yeah. uh, correct their error. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And so if someone thinks it's good to dominate people. We want to. Uh, put the case to them, as Mill says, and we want to do it in a way so that they will listen. And so here's some conjectures. Uh, remember, it's not a demonstrative proof. These are conjectures about what will take us there. And I certainly agree with you that if, if we were given a <coughs> logical account, we want to give the full flavor of the end the Buddha has in mind. But I want to abstain from that a bit and leave it reasonably open. Certainly with respect to some of the cases you mentioned, I don't, I mean, after a longer discussion, I don't see any reason to think that if you want to bring about social change or end domination, um, you would want to abuse people in doing it. That, that, that doesn't strike me as plausible, but there may be cases. And, and again, um, uh, it's not the unlogical, so there's room for righteous anger and all those things. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I feel, I mean, I do feel like this uh, follows along the, the same line, and so uh, I, ho I hope it's not um, redundant. But I mean, I'm just kind of one, unity is like not. It's like complex, the term complexity. I mean, we don't know, until we specify it, I don't feel like we know what we're talking about. What kind of unity? So I'm just thinking, you know, uh, how do we know that this principle is satisfied? Let me give you an example in a practical context. So here's something employers almost always say when a union organizing drive is underway. You're bringing division into the workplace. We were united. We were a family. When we had, you had concerns, you could come to us without mediation. You know, we, we had ways of working this out and so on. And now you're stirring up this division and this dis divisiveness and so on. You know, to which the, perhaps not the only thing to say, I mean, there may be some stirring up that's going on, but, but, but part of it is to say, no, there were already divisions. There were already conflicts. Conflicts of interest, conflicts of how people were perceiving and feeling about things, asymmetries in the way people were tra being treated, um, and you know, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, you you didn't have to confront that, but now you have to confront that, and so you know, I mean, I just, um, I just, I'm worried that this is, um, um, well, anyway, just what I mean, how do we know when this principle is satisfied and not, and you know, what. Um, what counts as introducing division? Well, uh, I think this is a different point, actually. And I, I, think it, I think it does, I mean, I can see how there's a connection. I think it does advance things. Listen, I, I'm sure the Buddha was a very solid trade unionist. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the very first thing he would have asked is whether it's true that we were one big family ahead of the game. And uh, if it was false, um, the Buddha would have regarded this as false speech. Uh, and it was a bunch of lies and ideology to be avoided. I hope it's clear that there's lots of resources in the first principle for, for ideal critique, right? Um, so that's one thing. It, it's not abstentionist in that way. The other thing is, notice that the Buddha says, um, with respect to the um, divisive speech principle, we're to avoid dividing people who are already together. 
And so you say, well, what about a case when they're not together? And the Buddha says, I'm talking about a case where they are already together. And you say, well, what if they're not together? So it's as if it's not really joining the argument at that point. <coughs> Your last point is a very telling one. And it tells not just about uh, the second principle, but all moral principles of any sort, anywhere. Uh, how do we know? Um, how, how would we prove it? And, and there are two ways to interpret that, and I think we need to distinguish them. One is, what's the criterion for success? And the other is, what's the decision rule? What's the procedure by which, you know, if we had to try this, you know, on trial for speaking divisibly, what would the forensics be? Because we're not dealing here, you know, here with the second problem at all, just, just with the criterial problem. My own suggestion was much narrower, obviously, than the Buddha's. The Buddha, the Buddha was concerned about at least the unity of the monks and Sangha, but I was trying to draw on some thoughts on the philosophy of language, um, uh, principally uh, Donald Davidson in the footnotes and David Lewis and H.P. Rice to suggest that before, it's a very important sense in which language itself is a cooperative enterprise. Um, you know, I'm trying to connect that up with Mill, but I, I, yeah, the, the Buddha would have, would have organized, in, in fact, when you think about it, in the Vedic culture, the first thing Buddha did was organize a trade union, yeah? effectively, without charging dues. Other <laughs> questions? Rob, did you? Yes, I um, so, so, first of all, just a quick, I, I'd love to try to First, quick historic point, so you're, you're drawing out medieval India, yes. and all those thoughts are clearly there, but you probably know this, I can tell you more later, but King Ashoka, who was also a Buddhist, had, had some very similar views on the edict that uh, in Padma India, the Rurta, yeah. you see, he talked about for uh, the growth of the essentials of Dharma, what we call Dharma, or best context, that we needed a certain kind of restraint in regard to speech. He's talking about many of the same things that we're talking about here. So just, it's a tradition that goes way back. Yes. And one, one thing um, that I wanted to point out is I, I think that, um, I think it's really useful to bring this into, into Western discourse because I think a, a lot of, the ways we tend to think about speech and the ways that you can criticize or not criticize speech uh, really presuppose a, a primarily cognitive conception of what the, the functions of speech are. So we, we think of it as true or false primarily, mm -hmm. and we seem to not think of the other things. That's good. What I think that um, <clears throat> what um, Ashoka, the Buddhist tradition, and all of them are, are doing is they're saying, um, and I do think you can bring Bryce into this, it's cooperative activity. Mm -hmm. And, and their speech acts, and one of the things that's principally important is that we can be using speech either to produce harmony um, or, or divisiveness um, within society. And I think they were especially concerned with that through uh, profound forms of religious difference for which there could be no final arbiter of truth. So, um, so, so I, I think it's a really important kind of um, uh, point that you can bring into, is to, is to realize that speech, just like right, Thought is not just about getting correct beliefs about the world. Mm -hmm. Right conduct is not just about you know, you know beliefs and desires. It, it's really a, a, a radically different conception about what the, what the functions of speech, mind, and conduct are that are meant to lead to more um, uh, creation of harmony rather than dissension. Right? And if you think about it that way, then um, then uh, you know you can have a lot of very interesting things that was going on with Trump. With the, you can blend in like the propaganda and the bullshit and all, all these other things that came out. I think a little bit about, but I think it goes much deeper than the Buddhist tradition. Thank you, Rob. I mean, I, so um, you're right. Most most of this looks at um, uh, truth act speech, and I, I don't hear uh, say very much about speech as other functions, including elocution and performance. So I've, I've done, I think you probably know some of that work elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and uh, it would be important to try to bring that into this general picture. So thanks for reminding me. Just as an example, yeah. one of the edicts says, it says, I mean, they basically think that there, there's no one way to conceptualize the divine. And so if certain sects extol their conception while disparaging others, that's a kind of abuse that... Um, it is. That, that appears in the sort of the uh, part of the wording more for part of the like, like, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? It's, so, so, so yeah. But, but it's not just a cognitive error. It's also a failure to recognize that there are aspects of what you're speaking that have not cognitive content. Yes. No, thank you. I, I, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. There, there are parts of speech that have to be thought of, uh, force of speech, it has to be thought of in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Right. Thank you. We agree too much. <laughs> so, so, Les, you, you, um, so I appreciate the starting point of this, which is that they, these are um, speech norms that are what's wise as it were, not meant to be prescriptions. But you also said towards the end, and I, I want to just get you to say a little bit more about it, that um, 
organizations like law societies yeah. and classrooms and whatever could do something mm -hmm. to um, foster. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I'm wondering where, how to think about the point at which fostering becomes a form of a form of prescription, right? So, I mean, we want mm -hmm. it in every form of deliberative governance that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've gotten to a point in which, you know, everybody says, oh, once upon a time, discussion across the aisle used to happen in yeah. really simple terms, and now it's just a shouting match, and, yeah. and, and, no, and, and so no decent discussion is in. So, and, and that happened through a kind of breakdown of some kinds of norms of civility about the sort of things you're talking about, about what constitutes right speech, a breakdown in those kinds of norms to the point where everything becomes a shut match. So that kind of illustrates the slide that I think you're talking about that makes these kinds of norms important. important. Um, but if you want to reverse that trend, aren't you at some point using, if not formal legal mechanisms, um, using informal social mechanisms of shunning and, and things like that, which look an awful lot like some forms of, of legal controls in order to enforce the yeah. right norms of speech. Yeah. Well, that, that's right, and uh, you're probably all familiar um, with con contemporary debates in which, uh, which, which Mill, by the way, would have uh, thought just as problematic as state uh, version of speech, as you say, Shunning the division and things like that. Um, but to go back to a point that I was making earlier about sort of thinking about the modularity of these problems, one thing we'll need to think about somewhere down the line is, is that cluster of problems, um, you know, the enforcement incentivizing uh, cluster. And I hope that that problem will be relatively independent um, of, of the question of whether there are speech specific norms and what they are. That's to say, we'll face that problem, whatever else we think about, about the other problem. Um, the way you formulated it made, made me a little uncomfortable. I, I, I think, don't think you meant to insist on this, but you say, what's the point at which shunning becomes, of course, the answer is, you know, is there's no point at which um, anymore. There's a point at which blue turns into green and just shade, shade into each other. Um, although there are clear cases in which shunning and ceasing to talk to people is as abusive uh, as state coercion, yeah, that's right. But I, I, I'm hoping that those can be treated relatively, in, relatively independently. Because, I mean, take another norm, not anti-discrimination norm, so, you know, one of the thing, things in your field, so different <coughs> norms, but we can raise exactly the same questions about those. Um, how we support them, enforce them, encouraging anti-discrimination toward enforcement. So, I kind of just think it's a, Again, the different modules that we have to plug into the whole theory. One of them is that module, but I'm, I'm hoping that it's relatively independent of this. I'm going to put myself in the queue. Um, I want to go back to something that I think Genevieve raised. They came up with a couple of questions, which I'm a little puzzled about because so none of these speech norms, right, are, have any. They're all defeasible. Yes. Okay, and then I don't see how we can have a view about when they apply and when they're defeasible without some further view about the underlying normative backing for them. And, and let me just give you a couple of examples. Right? So you said a couple of times that all ethical traditions endorse some version of the avoid false speech. Now that's false. I don't think you were lying when you said that. But you had obviously forgotten about Homeric ethics. It is no part of Homeric ethics to avoid false speech. In fact, it's just the opposite. Yes. Namely, that it's, a, it's indicative of a great deal of cleverness and skill to lie to people in order to achieve certain objectives. Right? Not necessarily objectives the Buddha would have endorsed, but which Homeric heroes tended to be fond of. Um, avoid abusive speech. Now, what does this do to my favorite philosopher, Nietzsche? Right? Now, he doesn't avoid abusive speech, nor does his favorite philosopher Schopenhauer, right? But at least in Nietzsche's case, he, his reason for thinking abusive speech is often very important is because he thinks you don't actually change people's view through rational discursive argumentation. He thinks you change their views by sort of arousing them at a sub-rational and, and emotional level. 
Um, so those are just two examples, but my worry is that to understand when these norms actually apply, we're going to have to hear more about sort of what the normative end, whether it's what conception of the good or whatever they're, they're supposed to serve. Yeah, so uh, thank you for reminding about the homework point. That's, that's good, so I'm going to put the almost in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think this is right. And as they say, I, I don't think this is a bug, I think this is a feature. Um, in the argument, because to go back to an early question, I, I want it to be reasonably independent of particular conceptions of human fortune. Now, there will be, you're not going to like this, radically deviant conceptions of human fortune. Each, obviously, when some, some ancient uh, uh, heroic culture is another radically deviant one that are, are just not going to not going to fit very tightly. But I want to be neutral as between, for example, uh, what Aristotle thought, what the Buddha thought, uh, what Benedict thought, what Hume thought, what Locke thought, what Hobbes thought. And this is quite a range. Now, uh, the reason I say it's a feature and, and, and not a bug in, in the program is, is that we would expect the way it spells out, that the fine brain lever to vary. Just as if we were utilitarians, we would expect the theory to, we would hope the theory would deliver a different account of an objectivist theory of the good, or a subjective desire satisfaction theory of the good, or whatever. And we wouldn't say, well, that's an objection, because it's going to be deliver, we're not going to know what to do until we know what happiness consists in. I think, I think a utilitarian should say, no, no, you've missed the point. The theory works by sitting on top of. So I want my theory to work by sitting on top of it, too. It's certainly not going to deliver answers until we pin that down, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. We have time for one more question. Did you have a question? Yes. Woman in white. Yes. Um, so um, my first question was, um, do some of the principles take like, uh, precedence over other principles mm -hmm. and other order in a order of importance? Yeah. For example, I would think that the first principle yes. is, is, the more, is the most important one for me. Like mm -hmm. when I have a choice of saying yeah. the truth, and, um, and when I'm saying the truth, I might uh, produce anger or some painful feeling. Um, in, a, in the target, I would prefer to speak the truth. And also, it's related to my second question. So when I'm producing um, some angle or painful feeling in the target, um, the influence of my this certain speech is not only limited to this target that I, um, that this person that I'm speaking to, um, this per like this. The, um, my speech can influence the actions of this person, um, and the actions of this person can influence the actions of a wide range of people, and maybe the painful, like, I can actually reduce the pain or anger, like according to the, your the Buddhist explanation, I can yep. actually reduce a larger amount of pain or anger in a wider range in, um, when I'm saying these Speech, like painful speech at this moment. So yeah. I'm just wondering if um, you are accompanying this distinction. Thank you. Those are, those are both excellent uh, problems. Um, and uh, the second one strikes me as quite telling, certainly for the, uh, the sort of structural justification I, I was offering. So there could be indirect effects. And sometimes we, we want to distinguish um, the value of conformity to a norm and the value of trying to conform to the norm. And you might say, and again, this is a module we we'll want to stick on the theory at some point. Maybe these, maybe these are good norms, but we shouldn't try too hard to conform to them. It's like the norm, you know, be happy is a good norm, but trust me, if you, if you I mean, somehow I felt like, I, I felt like this when I woke up this morning. You know, I, should, I should just try to be happier about this. It wasn't working, right? Um, uh, um, and, um, you know, uh, very often we, we want to have, a, you know, particularly with the side effects that you have in mind, I mentioned them at one point when I, when I was talking about um, uh, the way divisive speech can, you know, so it's had lateral effects in, in, um, in morality. But obviously that needs an awful lot more thought. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. that that's certainly a, certainly a possibility and a problem. The first one, is, is there a priority among them? I don't think that there is, but uh, this would require uh, work that I haven't done. 
And in particular, I'm, I'm not as attracted as you are by the suggestion that when we have to choose between causing pain to someone and telling them the truth, we should always tell them the truth no matter how painful. Um, now you can probably immediately think of the sort of counterexamples I have in mind. Uh, but um, even suppose that that were so, I wonder if it's really true that the truth norm is more important than the community norm. Um, because before we can tell someone the truth, we have to, or say what they believe is false, we have to be able to reach them, right? We have to, you know, the old, the old tag, we have to agree before we can disagree, agree at least on some things. Um, and I was trying to search for a very thin basis of unity way down at that deep level. The communal features of language that are undermined by certain kinds of divisive speech. Treat, treating someone else as not an interlocutor, for example. Someone that can be spoken to but not with, all that kind of thing. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it, 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 it's evident from the get go that these can conflict with each other. And nothing that I'm familiar with in the text gives us any resources to thinking about that. And whether you regard that as problematic depends on you know, our view about things like moral conflicts and. It's a familiar feature of moral norms that sometimes we will always end up doing wrong. We'll end up saying something false or we'll, or, or we'll end up dividing the community or we'll, um, And uh, some people, uh, like me, have a kind of tragic view of life and I just think that's the way things are. Sometimes we're, we're fated to, to do some wrong or other. Um, so I, want to I would carry that over to any kind of pluralistic view that has multiple principles and say, well, here's the bad news. It, it, you can't always satisfy these four together. Um, but that's a conjecture. I'm not, I haven't done that before. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Both excellent questions. So before we thank um, <coughs> Professor Green, let me mention there will be a reception out in the hall uh, right after the talk, where you're <coughs> welcome to come talk with Les Green informally. And with that, thank you, Les, for a very good right speech. <laughs>